In this video, we're going to discuss the Sintercast process for the production of compacted graphite iron. And the stable range for CGI is usually discussed in terms of the S-curve that we saw in the last video. And this suggests that CGI is stable over some range of magnesium. But as we saw in the previous video, um, the control of CGI depends equally on the amount of magnesium and the amount of inoculant. So at Sintercast, rather than using the magnesium S-curve, um, we've developed what we call the chessboard. Um, the chessboard shows all different types of cast iron as a function of the amount of inoculant and the amount of modification. And modification is the combined effect of magnesium and rare earths and offset by oxygen and sulfur, right? All of the things that modify the shape of the graphite. So on the chessboard, um, if we don't have any modification, um, and the inoculation is low, we make a type D gray iron. As the inoculant increases, we make a type B, and ultimately with high enough inoculation, we make a good type A flake graphite iron. And it's the same at the other end of the chessboard. When we have enough modification, um, we make a nodular structure, spheroidal graphite, and as we increase the inoculant, uh, we make more graphite nodules, and, and as we increase higher, still more graphite nodules. And what the chessboard shows is that CGI is stable inside of a four-sided window, yeah? And it's bounded on the lower end. When we reduce the modification, we start to make flakes, so we can't cross that line. Um, on the upper side and to the right, we have higher nodularity, either because of the inoculation or the modification, and that will lead to porosity defects. And at the lower end, we'll have a patchy, inhomogeneous graphite structure, or maybe even carbides. So in order to control the production of CGI, and we have to control the inoculant and the modification at the same time to stay inside of this window. So let's look at a video of the Sintercast sampling. So here we put the sampling cup on the Sintercast machine. The thermocouples are inside of the sampling module, so they go into the sampling cup when it's mounted. The operator takes a spoon of iron from the ladle. He lifts it over the sampling cup for two or three seconds. When the yellow light comes on, he can lower the spoon. Uh, just taking a chemistry sample here, it's a part of the normal foundry process, not related to Sintercast. So again, a spoon of iron from the ladle, I'm lifting the spoon over the Sintercast sampling cup for two or three seconds. The yellow light comes on. It tells the operator that the sample is successful. He can lower the spoon. And now the sample will stay there for approximately three minutes and solidify. And during those three minutes, we monitor the temperature as the iron solidifies. And depending on how it solidifies, we can say how the rest of the iron will solidify in the ladle. Yes? Um, so if we look at the sampling cup in more detail, we can see in the video that it's an immersion sampling. So this ensures that the iron inside the sampling cup is the same as the iron inside the ladle. With conventional sand cups, you have to pour the iron through the air. This exposes the stream to oxidation. There's a very high surface area to volume ratio in the stream. Maybe when the iron goes inside of the cup, it's in training oxygen. So the iron in the sampling cup is always, for us, always the same as the iron in the ladle. Um, when we lower the spoon, the iron flows over the edges of the sampling cup, so we always have a constant volume. We don't rely on the operator filling the cup fully. Um, and most importantly, when we lift the sampling uh, spoon over the sampling cup, the cup becomes hot and the iron and the, uh, the, iron and the sampling cup cool down together. So there's no chilling. The iron begins to solidify because it's ready to solidify. We've designed the sampling cup to behave as a sphere because the sphere is the easiest geometry con to control. Everything's happening uniformly in all different directions. And this is so important in the production of CGI because CGI is such a narrow material, we have to be sure that everything we're measuring is because of differences in the iron, not because of differences in the sampling technique. So we've designed the Sintercast sampling cup to provide very consistent sampling conditions. Um, again, as you saw in the video, the thermocouples that we use to monitor the solidification are inside of the machine. 
So we use one sampling cup for every ladle, but the thermocouples are reusable and they can be used up to 250 times. All of them are barcode labeled, all of them have a calibration factor, so we have complete traceability um, of the measurement. Um, and now the most important thing about the Sintercast measurement. As we said in the previous video, um, magnesium has a boiling temperature of about 1100 degrees Celsius. The iron in the ladle is more than 1450 degrees Celsius. So the magnesium is constantly evaporating off of the surface. Um, what we've done at Sintercast is to coat the sampling cup with a reactive coating. And the coating is designed to reduce the magnesium by 0.003% at the bottom of the sampling cup. So inside of the sampling cup, we have the tube that houses the thermocouple, the reusable thermocouple. We have one thermocouple in the center, uh, not in the geometric center of the cup, but in the thermal center of the cup. This is surrounded by unreacted iron and tells us how the iron is now at the moment of sampling. And the second thermocouple is touching the bottom of the tube and it's down in this uh, flow separated area where the iron has been able to react with the coating. And again, the idea is that down in this bottom area and um, we reduce the magnesium content by the reaction with the wall by 0 0.003 and that effectively tells us how the iron will be after 15 minutes later, yes? So the thermocouple in the center of the cup tells us how the iron is now and the thermocouple at the bottom of the cup tells us how the iron will be at the end of the production. And if we start to see flake graphite growing in the bottom thermocouple, we know that we have to add some magnesium before the start of production. Um, here you can see a cut section of our sampling cup after an analysis, and you can see this effect of the wall reaction. So here in the bulk iron, we have a good CGI structure, but down in the bottom where the iron has been stagnant and reacting with the surface, um, you can see that at the top where we've taken this uh, section, we have a good CGI structure, and down in the bottom we have flake graphite. It's a type D graphite because of the fast cooling. We're very close to the wall here, so we're cooling fast, type D graphite, but still flake. And when we can see this formation of flake in our cooling curves, we know how much magnesium we have to add to stay safely inside of the CGI window before the end of casting. Um, so in terms of the process, the iron in the furnace, in the melting furnace, is down in this area. It doesn't have any inoculant or it has a low inoculant. It doesn't have any magnesium. So we make the base treatment. We add the first amount of magnesium and inoculant and the iron jumps up somewhere on this chessboard. Maybe in one ladle it will come up to here and another ladle to here. Every ladle will be different. That's normal variation in the foundry process. So after the base treatment, we reach in and we take our sample and at the end of the analysis, we determine the inoculant level and the modification level. So in this example, this is our measured result. And as I said in the previous video, for each casting, we have to identify the size and the location of the specification window. And that's shown here for the casting that we're producing now. And the Sintercast philosophy is to always start the casting in the top right corner of the window because the magnesium is going to fade during the casting time and the inoculant is also going to fade. So if we start in the top right corner, we'll be able to stay inside the window before the end of casting. So we know where we are, we know where we need to be. It's a simple process then to add more magnesium and more inoculant before we start the casting. So in this example, we need seven units of magnesium. We add that by cord wire. It depends on the size of the ladle. In a small ladle, that might correspond to five meters of magnesium wire. In a large ladle, it might be 15 meters of magnesium wire. So we add the magnesium and we shift over to the magnesium start coordinate. And then again by cord wire, we add the inoculant and we shift up. So we add them separately. Um, in series production, all of last year, our average magnesium addition um, was 37 grams per ton. 
So you see that this final correction step is a very precise, uh, very accurate addition. Um, here in the foundry, um, we see the process flow. So we have the melting furnace. We'll tap into a ladle. Here we can tuck the base treatment, typically by wire nowadays, but also by sandwich or tundish cover. It doesn't matter what method the foundry uses. After the base treatment, we reach in and take our sample. It takes three minutes to solidify here on our sampling module. During that time, we transport the ladle toward the molding line. We de-slag it, we prepare it, we position it under the wire feeder. When the sample is complete, we automatically add the magnesium and then the inoculant and we begin casting. There's no delay. Usually the wire feeder is located on the pouring car. So if we look at that uh, in a schematic way, without the sintercast process, this is for magnesium now, if we have three ladles, we'll have three different starting points. The magnesium will fade, that's normal. Um, but the total range of magnesium in the castings will go from the highest magnesium content at the beginning of casting um, to the lowest magnesium content at the end of casting. With the sintercast measure and correct philosophy, uh, we still have three different starting points for three ladles. Um, but after we take our measurement and we have the result, we can add magnesium wire um, to bring them all to the same starting point. And then again, we're going to fade. That's natural. We can't change that. But from the same starting point, we have a much smaller range of magnesiums in the casting. And that's how we're able to stay not only in the narrow CGI range, but in the optimum part of the CGI, uh, of the CGI range where we have low nodularity, we have the best thermal conductivity, we have the best vibration damping, we have the best machine ability, and of course, resistance to shrinkage. So we have a lot more information about that, and if you want to know more, contact Sintercast.